Good morning. Uh, welcome to this week's View on Africa Briefing. My name is Stephanie Walters and I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at ISS. And I also focus on the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the subject of this week's View on Africa Briefing. Um, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes and then open up for questions to those of you who are online and our guests here in the room in Pretoria. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the elections, um, on the fact that we now have an election calendar and on what some of the responses have been to that election calendar and what the kind of general environment is. And I'll look also at the regional and international uh, responses to the election date. So it's been a while since we had a, a, a DRC view on Africa. Um, I think that many of you will know that a few weeks ago, after much uh, waiting, the Independent Electoral Commission in the DRC uh, published the electoral calendar, uh, setting elections, um, presidential elections, for the 23rd of December 2018. Uh, so in about a year. We've known for um, some time that elections, for logistical reasons, couldn't take place anymore in 2017. So there are obviously the political delays behind those elections, but by the month of October, we knew that the remaining three months of 2017 simply wouldn't be sufficient to complete the voter registration process and uh, proceed to elections. So, um, Sorry, I was saying that we have now an election date. It's the 23rd of December 2018. Um, there has been obviously quite a lot of criticism of that. Um, I want to start though with um, actually the visit by Nikki Haley and I'll, I'll go back to sort of the, the, the um, domestic responses a little bit later. So Nikki Haley, the US special, US's um, on, uh, sorry, ambassador to the United Nations, visited DRC uh, also a few weeks ago before the publication of the electoral calendar. Um, and she, um, after her meeting with Kabila, said that she wanted, that the US was insisting that elections be held in 2018. Now, I, I mention this because I think that in many ways, I, I, I do think it probably had some um, bearing on the, the, the relatively swift publication of the electoral calendar there, thereafter. But I, I want to really speak about it in the context of what it's done to some of the internal dynamics in the DRC. Um, I think that Nikki Haley's pressure um, could have been similar if she had simply said that elections needed to be held as soon as possible. I think by attaching a date to it, um, in some ways she has um, both legitimized the delay um, and also um, taken a little bit of the pressure off of the Kabila government and given some more, uh, taken the, the wind out of the sails, I would say, of the opposition campaign. Um, so as many of you may remember, after Etienne Chisikidi died in February, the opposition kind of fell apart a little bit. The political accord of December 31st um, um, wasn't implemented. There were many, many delays. And ultimately what we saw was the Kabila government really taking advantage of that disarray uh, in the opposition co-opting certain members of the opposition and naming them as prime minister and also as the head of the follow-up committee to the implementation of the accord. So since then we've seen a lot of the key elements and in particular the, the, the inclusive nature of that accord really fall apart um, and so it hasn't really been the roadmap that has been followed and it hasn't led to the kind of stability in the DRC that many had hoped the political accord would bring. Um, the opposition managed to regroup, I think, after some months of disarray, it really didn't have a plan B after Chisikidi died and after it became clear that the political accords wouldn't be implemented. It didn't have a plan B, but I think it rallied. It rallied sometime around June, July, um, and it, it sort of decided that maintaining pressure for elections to be held by the end of 2017 and maintaining uh, pressure and, and, and repeating that Kabila's mandate would really be um, uh, unconstitutional after December 2017. That was really kind of the, the key message that the opposition was rallying around. So I, 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 I think that when the US then came in and said um, the elections will take place in 2018, that looked in some ways like it would be okay if they were held in 2018, and um, it took a lot of the pressure off of the Kabila government. So I just want to start with that um, because it is, I think, significant. I, I, I think for the opposition it was a bit of a blow. Um, but now um, I want to turn to the kind of general environment. So we, we get an election date from the Independent Electoral Commission a few weeks ago. We know that they are planning on holding this election by December 23rd, 2018. Um, 
But other than that, absolutely nothing has changed. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean that the political environment remains repressive. We still have a lot of the key opposition figures who've been in prison for a very long time are still in prison. Um, that is also an element of the December 31st Accord that has never been implemented, was um, releasing some of these pr prisoners and also reviewing the legal cases against some of these key opposition leaders, notably Muiz Katumbi. That has not happened. We've continued to see civil society activists arrested, human rights activists arrested and political opposition uh, harassed. This is important because clearly if we are to believe that the Independent Electoral Commission is intending to hold these elections, we now need to focus on a number of different things. But one of them is the environment in which the campaign will take place, the environment in which political contestation will take place. And what I'm trying to say is that the level, there is no level playing field. And so, in other words, the government is still very much in control of the political environment and of the general um, sort of environment in the DRC. In fact, we had um, thought there would be um, um, some protest marches scheduled for this, the end of November, and the government has simply said we will not have any kind of political marches um, for the time being. So these are the kinds of things that we need to keep an eye on, because um, clearly um, the environment has not changed significantly yet. So do we really believe what the CNI is saying when it tells us that um, the elections will be held by, by the end of 2018? I think we still have a lot of doubt, and this matters because what we're trying to get to is a point of stability. We're trying to get to a point where the, electoral, the electorate in the DRC, the population in the DRC, feels that it is moving towards a resolution of this impasse, that the election will be credible, that it will be free and fair, and that we can then go back to focusing on the bigger picture in the DRC, which is economic growth and general you know, reconstruction of that country. I think the CNE and the government have not yet succeeded in creating that impression. Um, there also hasn't been the substantial reform of the Independent Electoral Commission that is necessary, and that is again an element of the December 31st Accord, so that's another um, thing to watch. And I think very importantly, we haven't had a clarification from Joseph Kabila himself about whether or not he intends to contest the next election. And this has always been really the primary sticking point. Um, Kabila has refused to uh, clearly, clearly state that he will not stand for a third term. Of course, he isn't allowed to stand for a third term according to the Constitution. Many suspect that he may try to maneuver again, even though the Constitution on this issue is locked down, this cannot be changed. Um, but his unwillingness to state very clearly that he will not stand is a primary obstacle to greater certainty, greater stability, and I think greater confidence that the elections that do lie ahead, whenever they take place, will be free and fair and will deliver a, a, an outcome that reflects what people have voted for. So those are some of the things I just want to flag. Um, some of the things, and I mean, because we've, we've been evolving in this um, climate of uncertainty and lack of confidence, of course, we always look for the next indicator of the, f of, of the government potentially further dragging its feet. Yes, we have an electoral calendar, but what are, what are we seeing um, concretely ahead of us? Um, we now have in Parliament, um, in fact, this week, uh, a new voters and a new electoral law. Um, this electoral law is controversial with a number of uh, key players, including within Kabila's um, own political camp, and I'll come back to that in a moment, um, because it is insisting that anybody who stands for, um, for the election has a th a 3 can, can garner 3% of the national vote, which, um, according to estimates, are about 900,000 voters. Now, that means that a lot of much smaller parties that are perhaps provincially based, but that are contesting at a national level, um, simply won't be eligible to participate in the election. Um, so it's obviously very controversial. A lot of people feel that it is designed to strengthen the ruling party, to strengthen not just the alliance, the majorité présidentielle, but the PPRD itself, because the majorité présidentielle has a lot of smaller parties in it, and to consolidate the PPRD's stranglehold, if you will, um, on, 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 the, on the national political scene. So it is causing a lot of um, trouble. Um, I mention it in this context because the fact that it hasn't yet been adopted and it was due to be adopted by tomorrow means that that potentially could see a further delay in, um, in, in, in the election date. 
Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons I mention it, and I'll come back to what I think uh, the potential implications for Kabila's own party might be. Um, the second big issue is um, money. So we have not seen a completion of the voter registration process, um, and that was essentially because the Independent Electoral Commission and the government halted the registration process in the Kasai provinces due to the insecurity there. Um, that potentially could resume um, rather soon, but there is now some talk about how there's still $60 million missing to finance that. Um, so the question is, where will that money come from? Does the government have it? Is the government expecting the international community to come up with this? And is this a real problem or is it um, a, a constructed problem that is intended to delay the voter registration process and therefore the election? So another red flag, I would say. Finally, also on the subject of financing, um, the overall cost of the three elections that have to take place, starting with presidential, in this next electoral cycle, is estimated by the government to be $1.3 billion. So it's a very, very heavy, heavily, uh, um, a very expensive election. The, the government is roughly saying that it needs um, just over 500 million US dollars from the international community um, to finance the, that electoral cycle. The problem here is that for the international community to step in and feel confident that it can provide financing, and I'm not suggesting that it can finance exactly the 500 that may be necessary, but even for it to begin to consider making pledges and making concrete donations to, to, the, to, to, to the elections, it needs more than just a calendar. It needs a lot more clarity about the voter registration process, about the voter register, and about a number of different technical aspects of this election. So until the CNE is able to provide that, and to provide that with transparency, it's unlikely that donors are going to immediately come to the party. And this matters because one of the things we suspect may be the dynamic is that the government will attempt to say the international community didn't come to the party, chose not to finance our elections, and that's why we can't hold them when we had said we would. So those are the three elements I would say are the red flags at the moment about whether or not we'll be on time with those elections. Now, I only have about uh, another five minutes to go through some of the responses uh, um, to this electoral calendar, so I'll try to make it quick and then um, take your questions. Um, what does the opposition think? Essentially, the Congolese opposition, the Rassemblement de l'Opposition, which is the primary um, uh, opposition grouping, um, has not greeted the electoral calendar um, with, with much acceptance. Um, they, they aren't very happy about the date. Um, there has been some suggestion that potentially um, they might be more willing to accept June 2018, so another six months. So obviously, we know the election's not happening uh, this year. So I think the position of the Rassemblement is you know, as soon as possible, um, and we think it can be done faster than another year. Um, and one of the other key players I want to speak about is the Conference um, Episcopal, um, who actually brokered the December 31st accord um, that led, you know, that, 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 that mapped out the 2017 roadmap, which unfortunately hasn't been properly respected. I think the Senko um, remains a very important voice in this conversation. Um, it's an apolitical voice. It's not a voice that is entirely neutral because it, of course, has been critical of what it sees as government delays. So it, it is, um, it's not a, a possible moderator or mediator in, a, in, in any kind of future talks if it came to that. But it is a credible voice and it is an apolitical voice. And I think, therefore, that when it puts out um, its relatively well-considered statements, it's the kind of thing that international players and regional players do pay attention to. So the Senko has been um, quite critical of the government's uh, electoral calendar. It has spoken about the fact that there is still the absence of, a, of an environment of, of confidence and credibility. Um, it has also insisted that Joseph Kabila come out and say he is not going to stand for a new mandate. Um, it has recommended that Parliament in particular monitor very closely the budget allocations that are made to the Independent Electoral Commission on the elections and that that be a means through which we can transparently measure progress towards those elections. Um, and it has also asked Parliament to reject any potential efforts to change the Constitution in the lead-up to the elections. 
Um, one of the, it has made recommendations to a number of players, to the government, it has asked that it respect the right to assembly, um, that it respect its own timeline on um, allocating budget to, um, to the elections, and that it, that it really move on implementing some of the commitments it made in the December 31st accord to opening the political environment, reviewing some of the cases against key political uh, leaders, and liberate some of the people who are, are still in prison. Um, so that's just briefly what the SENCO is saying. Um, in terms of what the international community is saying, um, I think there's been, it, it's, it's, it's been difficult for the international community on the one hand to say it's happy that elections are taking place in 2018 because I think it's trying to uh, stay away a little bit from the kind of um, tacit endorsement that perhaps um, Nikki Haley's statements were more close to. Um, but on the other hand, it has to also uh, recognize that we now at least have a calendar, which it has been demanding for a very long time. Um, so there's been, um, let's say, sort of lukewarm um, responses to the electoral calendar, but a general kind of um, approval of the fact that we now have one, and then um, insistence on more details about uh, preparation, therefore. MONUSCO has also been, I think, somewhat mitigated in its reply. Um, the organization of the Francophonie, um, has been playing a very important role in terms of a technical advisor and trying to um, provide sort of, let's say, technical uh, views <coughs> on where things should stand and where things could stand in terms of the election, and that's, I think, a very useful role. Um, and it, too, has lauded the publication of the uh, electoral calendar, but at the same time insisted that, um, that on a technical level, a lot more information is necessary. And then I'll end with, um, I'll end with one last thing, and then if, if there are questions about SADC and ICGLR, I've covered that in previous briefings, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, on the sidelines of the General Assembly, the UN, the AU, the ICGLR, SADC, and the OIF, um, agreed to put together an uh, expert advisory group that would be um, of assistance to the Independent Electoral Commission in, in the DRC, but would also be sort of a window into um, what is actually happening there, so a way in which donors and other key players, the opposition, civil society, could monitor uh, what's actually happening at the Independent Electoral Commission. I think that's a very good idea. Um, it hasn't yet been constituted, but I think that it, 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 it needs to be constituted as soon as possible. And I think in particular the sort of, um, the fact that this group has been recommended by, by continental players and international players, I think is very important for its credibility. So I think that's a really important step um, going forward.